afternoon everyone uh, we will be discussing today's Renska uh, defect uh, I'm Vulika I uh, will be going through the discussion of this quite uh, interesting topic very topical and uh, especially the management has got some nice interesting uh, controversies when you're looking at it my talk will include the introduction risk factors presentation diagnosis and uh, management and we'll also go through the management of the complications associated with the problem. Uh, Caesarean scar sections, uh, I mean Caesarean sections are most commonly performed procedures worldwide. They are life-saving for both the mother and the baby and especially when you've got a correct uh, indication. There is currently a significant increase in the Caesar rate and is more due to the maternal uh, Caesar at request and uh, also those uh, indications which are not quite clear. And uh, according to the WHO, the desired Caesar rate is supposed to be between 10 and 15%. Uh, what to call this defect has always been an issue. Currently, there's no consensus. So we've got uh, terms like your ismosil, your niche, your diverticulum, uterine transmural hernia, caesarean scar dehiscence, and also caesarean scar defect. For the sake of this presentation, I think we'll be talking more uh, for, uh, about the caesarean scar defect. Definition, it dates way back by Poyo Devin in 1961, where he said this is an hypoechoic area within the myometrium at the previous Caesar site. It moved on to uh, Peter de uh, et al. in 2011, where he said it is a pouch-like unechoic area at the, at the Caesarean scar with a depth of at least one millimeter. And Fervut uh, et al. in 2015, he said there's no clear consensus on the classification of Caesarean scar defect. Uh, Jordans et al. 2019 said it is an indentation at the Caesar site with a depth of at least 2 millimeters, and he further subclassified the niche into a simple niche, simple niche with one branch, and also a complex niche with uh, more than one branch. And we currently know because of the scarcity in the evidence of this air problem, the prevalence is between 19 to 88%. The risk factors, the most common risk factor is that one of a previous Caesar and the two meta-analyses, the one which we're looking also at the as previous Caesar as a risk factor, the first one was also at all in 2009 where he said previous Caesar times one is associated with 61% chances of a niche. Caesar times two, eight one percent uh, chances of a Caesar scar defect, and Caesar times three with up to close to hundred percent. And the one by Antina Longenstor at uh, I mean at Al in 2018, he said Caesar times one is thirty five percent, times two sixty seven percent, and times three eighty eight uh, percent. And the other risk factors will include factors like your retro vetted uterus, high BMI, diabetes mellitus, peripartal related infections. And when it comes to labor-related uh, uh, problems, it would be if you've been in labor for more than uh, five hours, if when your scissor was done uh, five, uh, at a cervical dilatation more than five centimeters, and one that was critical and of most importance was your suturing technique, where some of the studies actually show that your double layer and also unlocking sutures were associated with a thicker uh, residual myometrial thickness uh, post scissor but the latest uh, 2017 meta-analysis actually show that the chances of a scissoring scar defect were similar in all the patients with the either double layer or single layer locking or unlocking a, 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 a suturing technique when it comes to the presentation some of the patients are asymptomatic We've got almost 75% of them presenting with abnormal bleeding. And most importantly, it's usually during the follicular phase where they present with spotting. There might be also some form of a discharge which they present with. And this is classical as opposed to your progesterone deficiency, which will lead to your uh, luteal phase uh, 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 bleeding anomalies. And also these patients will present with pelvic pain symptoms that includes your chronic pelvic pain, your dis menorrhea or dyspareunia and also 4 to 19 percent of them might present with infertility and also other pregnancy related complications which one will include your caesarean scar pregnancy it will include your placenta previa placenta accreta and also uterine rupture and associated uh, bleeding uh, complications diagnosis in some instances you do see this patient presenting with infertility and the uh, hsg is done 
in those patients where you see an indentation at the ismetho uh, cervical area and then in those patients you actually can suspect an uh, uh, ismosin and it is during those times that you want to go and uh, do a, hystero a hysteroscopy or even an ultrasound to try exclude the possibility of a cesarean scar defect. Transvaginal sonography, it is a more accurate modality. It is better performed during the follicular phase because in, in, during that time you still have some fluid or blood collection within the cesarean scar, so it will give you a better perspective of the problem. And you can use or add it to a, a saline a, a solution or a gel using a 2D or a 3D, which will give you even a better a, a sensitivity. And most importantly, with a 3D, it also allows you to measure your residual myometrial thickness. And when looking at this uh, uh, diagram again, if you're looking at D, it's where actually D is a representation of your residual myometrial thickness, which is going to be the key of our talk. You can also look at the width and other issues, but the key of our talk from, to, I mean, onwards would be more on the residual myometrial uh, 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 thickness that is left after, uh, uh, I, mean, I mean, during the isthmosin. The other diagnostic modalities that we have, it's your MRI. What are the benefits of an MRI? More than any other thing is your residual myometrial thickness and the rest of the other things, it is not, it's actually not much more better except that it will, it can show you that if there are other pathologies, including your adhesions. But in any case, if you're planning to go for a laparoscopic operation, you will be able to see an overall picture of your pelvis. Hysteroscopy also is able to assist you whereby you can actually see one looking at the anterior aspect and also in some instances on the lateral aspect of your of, of, of your uh, 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 cervix while you're trying to move down from the fundus moving and navigating up until the cervix if there's any defect that you can be able to see on a hysteroscopy again better off during the follicular phase because you might even see some residual blood collection within that pouch uh, uh, area your management the key things or things to consider in these patients will be the age of your patient, the symptoms the patient is presenting with, and also the fertility desire for that particular patient. And our management options will be that one of medical management, surgical management, and the, and the other forms of management we will talk about depending on the particular case that you're actually dealing with. Medical management, there is evidence to suggest that your combined oral contraceptive is associated with almost more than 80% improvement in abnormal uterine bleeding. This is according to Zeng in 2016. Mirena also, abnormal uterine bleeding and also your pain-related symptoms. And with your AUP, it actually improves more than 88.3%. And this is according to Chen et al. in 2019. And remember very well, both uh, of these modalities, they are not suitable for a patient who's also looking forward to fall pregnant. Surgical management and approaches, you've got your hysterical resection, which we need to understand from the beginning. It is a simple resection, not a repair. The second one will be your laparoscopic repair. Third one, your vaginal uh, repair. And we look also at the combined hysteroscopic and laparoscopic approach. There are other modalities like your robotic and everything, but for the purposes of this presentation, these are the key things that we'll be looking at. What actually determines your approach of treatment is what we talked about on our ultrasound, uh, I mean, on our diagnostic modalities, which is your ultrasound 3D and also RMI, I mean, RMI, which is, uh, I mean, MRI which is your residual myometrial uh, thickness. So when you're looking at this patient, if you look, this was a flow diagram suggested by Donez in 2020, whereby he divided his patient in those patients who are having infertility and also associated uh, symptoms. And the patient who do not wish, I mean, uh, who do not even wish uh, to conceive. Now patients with infertility, and associated symptoms. If you've got your residual myometrial thickness less than three millimeters, then the best option to go for was laparoscopy or vaginal repair. But what he did is that post-operatively, he did also again an MRI. And if in an MRI, your residual myometrial thickness is more than three millimeters, then you are allowed to fall pregnant. And then after that, you elective scissor at 39 weeks. Now for a patient with a residual myometrial thickness more than five millimeters, he suggested that you do a hysteroscopic resection and you allow that patient to fall, fall pregnant and then you'll be able to deliver that patient at 39 weeks by elective season. And then there is a 
gray zone or a middle zone where you talked about residual millimeter thickness of more than three millimeters and also less than five millimeters and in those group of patients he said hysteroscopic uh, you can do your hysteroscopic resection and coagulation of the base which we'll talk most importantly about later on and after that you do your mri again if post-operative rmi your residual myometrial thickness is less than three millimeters then you subject those patients to the second operation which will include either your laparoscopic uh, uh, approach or your vaginal approach but if it's more than three then the patient is supposed to fall pregnant now for simplicity and practicality and looking at the situation whereby you may not have mri readily available the simplest approach will be to say if i see a patient has got a residual myometrial thickness of more than five millimeters and she still wants to conceive, I can go for a hysteroscopic uh, uh, resection and ablation of the base. But if my patient has got a residual myometrial thickness less than 5 millimeters, it is best to take a, a, that approach that would include either your vaginal approach or your laparoscopic approach because you know those patients, they are actually associated with increased re residual myometrial thickness post-operatively as compared to hysteroscopic approach. Now, in a patient who do not wish to conceive, those with uh, symptoms, it depends. If they are happy with the medical treatment, like we've explained, you can put them on uh, combined oral contraceptives, you can put them on progestins, you can put them even on Mirena. But if for some reason, one reason or the other, they are not keen for medical treatment, you can offer them surgical treatment. Where you're, when the residual myometrial thickness and they don't want to fall pregnant is more than 3 millimeters, hysteroscopic resection is actually completely fine. If it's less than 3 millimeters because you are also afraid of blood, I mean, perforation into the bladder, you can in those patients even be radical to a form of um, a total uh, uh, laparoscopic uh, 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 hysterectomy. But it is actually not necessary. You can even do a simple repair. In a patient who are completely asymptomatic, then it's an issue of follow-up, no need for operation or treatment in those group of a patient if it's an incidental finding. Starting with a hysteroscopic resection, uh, remember, as we have said, it is just res resection of the edges of your Cesarenska defect. It is not a repair. And most importantly, you have to do an electrocoagulation of the base with the roller ball and the only reason we are doing this there is it actually that base is associated with 27.2 percent of endometriosis and this is according to the study which was done by Dunimari in 2015 again there is one study by Donez which also actually reported a rate of around about 21 percent so it is something that is there that you need to be aware of and in this group of patients you definitely do have to bend the base and also if possible when when you are doing your 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 your, your a resection you can also try to resect the base if you're not going to do the the, the, the coagulation and ablation of that base if the patient is requiring pregnancy it is what we have talked about that at least you need that a thickness of more than five though in in, in my in this slide i've put that one of 3.5 we have talked about this and we've settled it that if it's more than five then you can do your resection because if you're using 3.5 you're still sitting within that gray zone which will actually require you to have more other investigative modalities post-operatively your, your 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 hysteroscopy is uh, actually associated with minimal risk of bladder injury and pelvic infection it is associated with 59.6 percent 100 percent improvement of symptoms 6.6 100 percent pregnancy rate post-surgery and most importantly 86 percent failure rate in cases of a retroverted uterus and this is one diagnosis that you're going to get on ultrasound, which I think even from the beginning, it's what you're supposed to say that if I've got a patient desiring to, to fall pregnant or symptomatic patient, and he's got a, even irrespective of them, including the uh, residual myometrial thickness, if that uterus is retroverted, it might actually be beneficial to go for laparoscopic repair, which I'll explain when I get to that uh, slide of a laparoscopic repair. Uh, there is evidence to suggest the feasibility and also the effectiveness of a second hysteroscopic res uh, 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 resection of an uh, ismosin. Laparoscopic repair, it allows a complex exploration, uh, uh, exploration of the pelvis, like I've said, 
bladder dissection with complete resection of the fibrotic tissue and double layer suturing, which I'll explain in the subsequent slide. In case of a retroverted uterus, it gives you a chance for anti-flexion by shortening your round ligament, and, uh, and this can be done also to decrease the chances of a, a failure rate. And this was a beautiful study which was done by Fairwood et al. in 2018. 64%, 100% symptom improvement. Season, uh, 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 defect recurrence was minimal in laparoscopic treatment. And these patients were allowed, even uh, with the hysteroscope, even with the laparoscope, to actually attempt pregnancy in three to six months post repair. And there is no evidence to say. But generally, we tend to treat these patients with Cisneska, like we treat your fi patient with uh, fibroids, where you have done a myomectomy and a period of at least three months is completely adequate, as opposed to treating them like you're treating them like a Cisneska section, where you want at least 18 months before you say uh, uh, they can actually fall pregnant. And uh, the take-home baby rate actually in these patients with laparoscopic repair range from 21% to 75%, and this is according to a study by Dalin in 2017. This slide is actually showing an interesting pictures of your ismosil or Cisneska defect where there's fibrotic tissue and you can see, and the difficulty is actually seeing and identifying it once you have started to, uh, 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 reflecting the platter downwards. And the patients where you're going to struggle to see are those patients where they still have some residual myometrial thickness. But again, you can do a combined where you can use your hysteroscopy and be able to see from underneath where it is. Or you can even try, some people have suggested the use of a hair gas dilator and put it into the, in the scar so as to be able to see it on the laparoscopic approach. After that, you can put at least three stitches. Uh, and uh, before you tie them, just put them through and cut and then you tie them one by one after you've inserted those stitches and you can put the second layer there is i mean you also do the second layer with the closure of the peritoneum there's really no evidence you can close the peritoneum you cannot close the peritoneum with the vaginal repair you do it more like you're doing your vaginal uh, hysteric i mean hysterectomy where you get your cervix try to do your bladder resection and uh, from the from the uh, I mean from the from the vaginal area from the cervix going up, and then you'll be able to identify the the scar and try to do the repair. But it was associated with more complications of hematoma in 2.5 percent of the cases, pelvic infection, 2.4 percent of the cases, and the cesarean scar defect persistence was 13 percent to 31 percent with a pregnancy rate of 39 percent. And what is key for both hysteroscopic resection and vaginal repair is that it does not give you an advantage of cause i mean of uh, doing an anti version in a case of a retroverted uh, uterus which is the main effect that is associated with recurrence or persistence of this particular problem in a, in a, in a, in, a pre in patients presenting with then with the uh, there was a nice beautiful uh, meta analysis in 2010 which uh, i mean systemic uh, review which was uh, uh, presented by Yunnan He in 1920. And all he actually looked, he looked at four surgical strategies for the treatment of Cisneska scar defect, which was the hysteroscopic resection, laparoscopic repair, vaginal, and combined. And at the end of all, he actually looked at, at this one, looking at the symptomatology and the resi residual myometrial thickness. And out of all these four modalities, laparoscopic approach was associated with improvement of your abnormal uterine bleeding better than and the depth of the scar which was more or the residual myometrial thickness which was more in the case of laparoscopic repair as compared to vaginal and hysteroscopy and hence from the beginning we said if you're struggling with issues of your myometrial thickness in a patient who wants to fall pregnant your best option that you have will be your laparoscopic approach Cesarean scar defect and infertility, like we said from the beginning, 4% 4, 4 to 19%, they run a risk of infertility. The mechanism is just a simple toxic environment where there will be a bloody fluid in the vagina and uterine cavity will impair the sperm movement to your cytotic effect of your ion, which is related to that blood which is left within the scar may actually be cytotoxic to your sperm and also the embryo and also impairment of the endometrial receptivity secondary to your ion, high increased iron levels.
So these patients, that's the reason why they end up sometimes with infertility. There's a nice uh, uh, article uh, which actually looked uh, at, uh, at ismosil and ovarian stimulation. Now, where I'm going, uh, where, where we need to be aware is that now in a patient who presents with infertility and Sizrenska defect, where the infertility has got other problems associated with, then in those group of patients, if you are infertility, you've got other symptoms, abdominal bleeding and pain, you do a surgical approach. But if you've got other causes of infertility, for example, a tubal fat, then we will do an IVF for you. But if you are undergoing, for whatever reason, IVF, you need to know that if you're doing an ovarian stimulation, those patients, the ovarian stimulation is associated with almost 40% of your intracavitary fluid and we are aware of the fact that if your intracavitary fluid is more than three millimeters then that one is associated with detrimental effect in your uh, uh, reproductive outcome so that is why we suggest that when you are doing treatment for this patient for ivf you try to exclude any possibility of the fluid in the event there is any fluid then you can use your uh, embryo transfer catheter to try and suction that fluid and do the transfer but if you don't do it through before the transfer you will definitely compromise your reproductive outcome so you need to be aware of this and also you need to know how do you have to um, how do you manage it you don't have to cancel the cycle you can only suction uh, that endometrial intracavitary uh, 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 fluid the next topic that we will be addressing under the talk again will be your cesarenska pregnancy and uh, it is simply an implantation of the gestational sac in the previous hysterostom uh, I mean hysterostomic scam. It is relatively new type of ectopic pregnancy. It is related to increased caesarean deliveries. It represents 6% of all ectopic pregnancies in women with at least one previous caesar. And uh, the main issue with it is that early diagnosis and management are of paramount importance how does this problem present non-specific symptoms your cesarean pregnancy most of the times may be missed most clinical finding that is found may be a vaginal bleeding it is associated also with low abdominal pains in some patients it presents both with vaginal bleeding and low abdominal pains and one third of incidental diagnosed cases are completely asymptomatic and generally, the gestational age of diagnosis is between 5 and 16 weeks with a mean age of 7 plus or minus 2.5 weeks of gestation. Now, there's this uh, a, a nice uh, a systematic review which also was uh, presented, I mean, uh, done by Gonzalez et al. Or I mean, Gonzalez and Tulandi in 2017. And what I wanted us to understand out of this, uh, 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 I mean, uh, 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 this table where the demographics of the patient with Cesarenska pregnancy. Now, if you note, they have round about eight studies which, were, which they looked at and looking at this demographic, demographic uh, uh, information. What was key, only two of these, uh, 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 no, I mean, uh, only two of these uh, studies where it did not show the number of previous Cesarean section. And the majority of them, it was previous Caesar times one. And the percentages of the previous Caesar times one were high in most of the uh, of the studies, where it was 71% in the first study, 89.9, 94, and 77. And one study by Oyang in 2015, actually all patients were previous Caesar times one. And it was only Wang in 2006, where only 25% of the patients were previous Caesar times one, 50% previous Caesar times uh, 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 two, and probably the other 25% were previous Caesar times three or four, or whatever the case may be. The reason why I picked up this slide was that the majority of the patient who presented with a Caesar and scar pregnancy were previous Caesar times one. And it only alerting us of how important it is to try in all way possible way to exclude a possibility of a caesarean scar pregnancy in a patient present, presenting where you are doing a first trimester ultrasound. We will go to the diagnostic parameters you're supposed to look for, but if you don't keep it 
in your mind when you're doing the scan in these patients, you will definitely miss uh, this problem. And if you remember very well, we put a, a Caesar and previous Caesar as the risk factor. And where previous Caesar times one, we had a significant contribution of a Caesar and scar defect. And hence, at the end, these patients will present with one of the complications, which is your Caesar and scar pregnancy. Your Caesar and scar pregnancy is divided into two types, where we have type one, which is the endogenic and type two, the exogenic. And, and, and the, the endogenic type one, it simply means your Caesarenska pregnancy progresses towards your uterine cavity, and this could result into a viable pregnancy, but with high risk of bleeding and placenta and, and, and at the placental side. And your type two exogenic, the, uh, the Caesarenska pregnancy will progress towards the bladder or the abdominal cavity, and it is most of the times complicated by bleeding in early pregnancy and also uterine rupture. The diagnosis of this type of a problem we will use usually by a vaginal ultrasound and with a vaginal ultrasound the key things or criteria that you need is visual visualization of an empty uterine canal and endocervical canal, detection of the placenta and gestational sac embedded in the Cesarenska site. At the gestational age of less than eight weeks you will be able to find a triangular gestational sac at the Caesar's scar. And if the gestational age most of the time is more than eight weeks, your gestational sac will be round form or even oval. What is important again is that you will have a thin uh, a, a, a residual myometrial thickness of one to three. And in some instances, it might be completely absent and it will just see the gestational sac and the bladder. Most importantly, the, 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 the endocervical, I mean the cervical canal will be closed and it will be empty. Your gestational sac will be with or without a fetal pole or cardiac activity. And most importantly, again, your vascular flow, there will be a vascular flow around your gestational sac. And, uh, and this, remember, will not be there in an aborting intrauterine pregnancy. And the last thing will be a sliding sex sign, whereby if you've got a cervical pregnancy, when you're pushing your probe inside, you will be moving with the cervix and also with the uterus. And this you might not get, especially in the type 1 endogenic type of a cesarean scar defect. And these are the things <clears throat> that you're supposed to look for when you're doing your ultrasound. And be try and try to be as a, 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 a detailed as possible. Now, these are the pictures which actually uh, uh, show us of the things that you're supposed to look at. And the picture firstly at A, it shows your cervix, which is completely empty, your endometrial cavity, I mean your uterine cavity, which is empty, with a small gestational sac sitting at the seasons, I mean at the I mean at the Cisarenska area. And your picture number C even shows you much more better and also with a measurement of your uh, uh, your, your myometrial thickness that is left. Your B is the vasculature, which is increased around, which will definitely be absent in the case of an aborting um, in, in the case of an aborting uh, intrauterine pregnancy. Or now, with looking at these ones, you'll definitely see your cervix is completely cervical canal empty. You can see the cervical scar area with a pregnancy, and also your uterine cavity that is empty, and the blood supply around your gestational sac. The management of this patient, there is no consensus of the treatment and management of your cesarean scar pregnancy. And treatment varies from expectant management, your medical management, your local management, and surgical approach. And even within the surgical approach, there's different modalities that can be uh, employed, which we will discuss about them shortly. And what is important is the objective of treatment is to preserve fertility and prevent life-threatening complication which are associated with this a, 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 a complication of a cesarean scar defect. Uh, uh, this uh, 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 diagram again or this table again I, I got it from the uh, that um, Gonzalez article and uh, Tulandi 2017 that systemic review we where they actually tried to tease the I mean uh, uh, a majority of the treatment modalities which we, uh, uh, which which we actually have been published, and remember, because it's not a very common problem, some of the uh, uh, articles which was mostly just case reports, and some of them were just case series. And looking at, for, for instance, as the first one by in at Al 2014, he used local metrotrixate. The others also local. The others were using systemic 
and others, which was a combination of treatment where you use uterine artery embolization and the uh, dilatation and curettage, and in some instances, uterine artery embolization followed by hysteroscopy, and the other one by uh, Wang in 2006, where you used um, a laparoscopy. What is of key importance is that in the group of patients which were treated with metrotrixate and DTNC, there were four patients with ended up with a hysterectomy. And uh, also one patient in the group of uterine artery embolization and DTNC ended up with a hysterectomy, where only patients with uterine artery and DTNC uh, embolization and DTNC and also the one by laparoscopy did not have an, a, 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 a hysterectomy being, I mean, a hundred percent success rate and did not have a, have a hysterectomy. So with this type of evidence, we get to know at the end, I will discuss what would be the best approach when you see this patient and if, because there's no very good evidence that is they're looking at the best management way for this patient. Like I've said, there are people who have actually looked at expectant management and one of the studies was done by Oyanga et al. in 2015. But the key issue was the risk of placenta accreta, uterine rupture, and uh, massive hemorrhage, usually result, uh, resulting in hysterectomy. And if we're looking and we're saying our key objective was fertility preservation and also, most importantly, saving, I mean, as, uh, uh, preventing life-threatening, then this is one form of management which you have to counsel your patient extensively about and unless patient does not want active management then you can say but generally these patients you're supposed to have money from some form of management whether in a medical form or in a surgical form with the uh, methotrexate uh, uh, management what you have to do with the patient is with metrotrexate is actually divided into two. You've got your local management with metrotrexate. You've got a systematic uh, 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 treatment with uh, 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 metrotrexate. But what we have to look at is uh, what are the key things that you're supposed to look at before you start your patient on treatment. One is hemodynamically stable patient. Two, unruptured mass. Three, no contraindications to metrotrexate. Then you can say, I can offer this patient um, a, 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 a metrotrexate uh, management. But According to 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 uh, to Bedouin in 2015, metrotrexate in season scar was much more successful in patients who had a beta ACG of less than 20. I mean 12,000. There was no cardiac activity, and the gestational age was less than uh, eight weeks. What are the contraindications uh, uh, for metrotrexate? You've got your absolute contraindications and your relative contraindication. And this is the whole list of things that you're supposed to look at. And this is actually taken from the uh, practice committee of the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, which was published in, a, a published in Fertility and Sterility in a, a 2013. These are all the things that you're supposed to look at of what are you going to be, I mean, what you use as your contraindications to your metrotrexate management. Going briefly on the absolute contraindications, if you have any intrauterine pregnancy, any evidence of immunodeficiency, moderate to severe anemia, leukopenia, and a hemodynamically unstable patient, inability to participate in the follow-up, and all other problems. And uh, 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 those ones will definitely give you your absolute contraindications with the relative embryonic cardiac activity dictated by transvaginal ultrasound, high initial ACG concentration, which we'll talk about it, uh, uh, ectopic pregnancy greater than 4 cm in size, and also refusal to accept blood transfusion. Those are all relative contraindications to the management of these patients. The next slide, I, 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 I'm sorry, I know it's a bit busy slide, but all what I'm looking at is these are some of the treatment modalities or the protocols that we can, I mean, that we have for metrotrixate treatment. And the, these uh, 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 treatments were taken to the America, uh, from the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynae in management of ectopic pregnancy in 2018, where they divided them into three single dose regimen, two dose regimen, and also your multiple dose regimen. And generally, we know in summary, your single dose regimen is associated with less side effects in overall, but less uh, uh, success uh, uh, of the, the treatment meaning which more patients end up requiring either a second dose or end up, end up, end up with a surgical management. And your multiple dose treatment is associated with increased chances of resolution, but it's associated with also 
uh, systemic uh, 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 side effects of your methotrexate. And what comes in between is your two-dose regimen, which I was associated with increased levels of treatment resolution and also minimal form of your side effect profile coming from your, your metrotrixate. And your follow-up is simple, for instance, starting with your single dose uh, treatment, whereby you start them on 50 milligrams per uh, meter squared intramuscularly on day one. You measure your ACG level post-treatment on day four and day seven. You want a 50% reduction. If you get that, then you continue with weekly uh, uh, reviews up until you've got a negative beta ACG. But in the patients with is less than uh, 15%, then you administer the second dose and continue again with your management. With your two dose regimen, you 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 it it you, you 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 give it on day one, you repeat it again on day four. Then you measure your metrotrexate on uh, I mean your ACG on day four and day seven. If decrease more than fifteen percent, continue like in a single dose. If it's less than that, uh, it's less than fifteen percent, you repeat another dose on day seven and take your ACG on eleven. If it's more same as single dose, but if it's less than 15% again, you do it again on day 11 up until day 14. And if there's nothing on day 14, then you result on surgical management. Your multiple dose regimen is simple. It's one milligram per kg body weight, giving it on day one, day three, day five, day seven. And you also have to alternate it with folinic acid at 0 0.1 milligrams per kg uh, intramuscularly on day four. I mean, two, four, six, and eight. Now, the other modality of treatment that we have for this patient is a uterine artery embolization. It is beautiful modality because it minimizes your bleeding uh, problem and it can be used concomitant uh, 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 with increased success rate uh, as a primary treatment for a CSP where you are using your metrotrixate or even your suction turitate to use it with, with, I mean, with uterine artery embolization. But uh, uh, uterine artery embolization is associated with decrease of ovarian reserve, your IUGR, your placenta abruptio, and your placenta accreta. And this, again, is taken from Gonzalez and, and Tulandi in 2017. And it is for the same reason, even in patients where we're treating them for uterine fibroids, we usually suggest that if they're still requiring or seeking fertility, it might not be the best idea for those patients to go for uterine artery embolization. Your hysteroscopic approach, minimal invasive alternative, mostly used for type 1 uh, Sirenska pregnancy, as well as a follow-up treatment, allows good visualization of your gestational sac, done using your recetoscope, where you are using a loop with no electricity, then you can control the bleeding with electrocoagulation, or you can even use your intrauterine folin, uh, uh, folin uh, balloon catheter later on, after finishing the operation. It is associated with faster recovery, short follow-up and rapid decline in your period SCG. But what is important and you have to keep in mind that it should be performed by a, a skilled hysteroscopist because sometimes it can lead to bleeding and also an incomplete removal of your gestational sac will lead to persistence of the disease and also which will increase your duration of your follow-up. Laparoscopic approach applicable mostly for type 2 Sirenska pregnancy and it can be done up until 11 weeks of gestation. It must be uh, offered to patients who are hemodynamically stable and also must be done by a very experienced surgeon because also it is associated with bleeding. And uh, it's associated with reduced, uh, uh, I mean, it reduces the bleeding, to reduce the bleeding in the patient where you're going to offer them laparoscopic uh, uh, approach. You do a diluted vasopressin and injection. You can also do a bilateral uh, uterine uh, occlusion for those patients. And uh, then those, one, I mean, that uh, uh, approach will actually be able to reduce your bleeding. What is important with this one, again, uh, is that you definitely need an experienced surgeon. Now, lastly, and most importantly, is that when you're looking at all these modalities, you can always combine where you use your uterine artery embolization with your DDNC or with your metrotrixate, even with your laparoscopic approach or your hysteroscopic approach, you can also put them on metrotrixate. But the minute you decide, because in some instances, your diagnosis on transvaginal uh, ultrasound might not be quite clear to tell you if it's a type 1, type 2. So a best approach in those group of patients will be a combined laparoscopy 
and hysteroscopy so that at the end you'll be able to see and treat your patient adequately. And what is important is that with your hysteroscopic approach, depending, you can investigate them later on with your transfer channel ultrasound, get the residual myometrial thickness and see if you have to treat them uh, uh, for future fatality purposes. My take-home message for this presentation before I can, uh, we, we can call it a day is that we have noted there's an increasing number in the, in, in the cesarean rate. And if we have that huge increase, we definitely need to be aware of the cesarean scar defect and also a cesarean scar pregnancy. And the only reason is it might only be one of the reasons why your patient is presenting with AUB, chronic pelvic pain, or even infertility and more than any other thing it is one of might be one of the causes of an intractable bleeding in a patient who present with a cesarean scar ectopic pregnancy and these patients you can be able to save them if you have your diagnosis at an earlier stage and will have a very good form of management and be able to save these patients and uh, this is my last slide and i'd love to thank you everyone for giving time to go through my presentation and my talk and listen and if there are any questions uh, unfortunately i didn't write my email address at the end you are free to email me to get all the articles that we have looked at and be able to do your referencing and check if there's any other thing you want to 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 to, to discuss about and unfortunately uh, due to these covid times and a period it is difficult to have an interactive session it could have been lovely if we were to sit discuss all other controversies have questions, and they also get to uh, have a nice discussion at the end. I thank you. Thank you very much.